Greetings, comrades. I want to begin this episode with an anecdote. <clears throat> after the renaming Stalingrad into Volgograd, from the afterlife, a telegram arrived to the Central Committee. It said, <clears throat> Agreed. Yosef Volgin. And another one. A lecturer of political sciences, of course, uh, gives uh, gives a report in a, in a large factory uh, in the party meeting there about uh, the successes of the five-year plan. And he starts speaking. In the city A, an electro station was built. And some, some voice from the hall, hall just says, well, I was just there recently. There is no electro station there. And the lecture continues. In the city B, a chemical factory is built. And the same voice. Oh, no, no, I was, I was there a week ago, too, and there is no factory there. And Lecter gets really angry and, and replies to him. But you, comrade, should, should really travel around less, and you should read more newspapers. And what can we learn from this? One, Stalin controlled everything. Two, newspapers in the USSR were everything. And guess who was a huge fan of newspapers at the dawn of the Soviet Union? Well, you probably guessed correctly, because you've looked at the name of the series, of course, but, um... Stalin, comrades, knew the power of the press. That is why he started and edited so many of press releases and so many magazines. So, for one, in March 1906, while in Tbilisi, Stalin, under the pseudonym E. Besoshvili, which means son of Beso, and that's a nice mental image right there, if you remember what his dad was like, worked in the revolutionary newspapers Sunrise and Lightning. One of Stalin's most important articles, Agrarian Question, is published in this time. In the article, he speaks about how the land reform should be implemented after the revolution. Here's an excerpt from the article that shows what Stalin intended to do with the land, and also shows his style of argumentation, and how all of these socialists, social democrats around these parts had analyzed, over-analyzed Marx and his writings to no end. <clears throat> Quote, We have seen that neither socialization, nor nationalization, nor municipalization can properly meet the interests of the present revolution. How should the confiscated land be distributed? Into whose ownership should it be transferred? Clearly, the land which the peasants confiscate should be transferred to the peasants to enable them to divide this land amongst themselves. This is how the question raised above should be settled. The division of the land will call forth the mobilization of property. The poor will sell their land and take the path of proletarianization. The wealthy will acquire additional land and proceed to improve their methods of cultivation. The rural population will split up into classes. An acute class struggle will flare up, and in this way, the foundation for the further development of capitalism will be laid. As you see, the division of the land flows logically from present-day economic development. On the other hand, the slogan, the land to the peasants, only to the peasants and to nobody else, will encourage the peasantry, infuse new strength into them, and help the incipient revolutionary movement in the countryside to achieve its aim. As you see, the course of the present revolution also points to the necessity of dividing the land. Our opponents say to us, accusingly, that in that way we shall regenerate the petty bourgeoisie, and that this radically contradicts the doctrines of Marx. This is what Revolutionary Russia, edition number 2, writes. <clears throat> By helping the peasantry to expropriate the landlords, you are unconsciously helping to install petty bourgeoisie farming on the ruins of the already more or less developed forms of capitalist farming. Is this not a step backwards from the point of view of orthodox Marxism? Now, I must say that the messieurs, the critics, have mixed up the facts. They have forgotten that landlord farming is not capitalist farming, that it is a survival of feudal farming and consequently the expropriation of the landlords will destroy the remnants of feudal farming and not capitalist farming. They have also forgotten that from the point of view of Marxism, capitalist farming has never followed directly after feudal farming, nor can it do so. Between them stands petty bourgeoisie farming, which supersedes feudal farming and subsequently develops into capitalist farming. Karl Marx said in volume 3 of Capital that historically feudal farming was followed by petty bourgeoisie farming and that large-scale cap capitalist farming developed only after that. There was no direct leap from one to the other, nor could there be. 
And yet these strange critics tell, tell us that to take away the landlord's lands and to divide them up means retrogression from the point of view of Marxism. Soon they will say to us accusingly that the abolition of serfdom was also retrogression from the point of view of Marxism, because at that time too some of the land was taken away from the landlords and transferred to small owners, the peasants. What funny people they are! They do not understand that Marxism looks at everything from the historical point of view, that from the point of view of Marxism, pity bourgeoisie farming is progressive compared to feudal farming, that the destruction of feudal farming and the introduction of pity bourgeoisie farming are essential conditions for the development of capitalism, which will subsequently eliminate pity bourgeoisie farming. It kind of seems strange that in this uh, this article he says that, you know, we should encourage this pity bourgeoisie farming, but again, if you read into Marx a bit, you can see that Stalin is following Marx's doctrine very clearly. Stalin sees the evolution of Marxism. He doesn't want to take it straight to kolkhoz and collectivization. No, Marx believes that uh, this pity bourgeoisie farming must be created, which will then be overtaken by capitalist farming, and the capitalists will then start exploiting the farmers and turn their lives into miserable living hell, and then, then the farmers will be finally ready to throw off their chains and, you know, do some real true socialism. Which is weird, because Stalin, Stalin wants to make farmers' lives worse so that they could themselves make it better. But I guess he really follows this determinism of history a lot. But, uh, yeah, this is, this is where we can clearly see the way Stalin thought. At any rate, at the end of the march, in the party conference which began in Tbilisi, but ended in Baku, Stalin's idea was presented. It was the boycott of Gosduma and the necessity of using <clears throat> non-parliamentary forms of struggle. And this is where his ideas of giving land to the farmers come under serious discussion. This is so because the delegation from the Caucasus United Social Democratic Party is mostly Mensheviks, Stalin being the only Bolshevik candidate out of the ten sent there. Later on, during April, Stalin visited the 4th United All-Russian Social Democratic Party Congress in Stockholm. There, he again talks about how Bolshevik way of acquiring power is way, way more superior than the Menshevik one, about his land reform and, well, even more assaults on the Mensheviks. From the memories of Voroshilov, printed in Brezhnev's era, we find out that Stalin, apparently, by this point, had trained to have excellent memory, being able to quote from a large amount of literary sources by head. From this congress, he'll send a letter to Tbilisi, under the name of M. Monsalidze, when he'll declare to his, his comrades that he intends to visit Germany on his way back to Tbilisi, because he needs to visit Germany to meet his good friend Alexander Svanidze there. And you know what? I actually haven't told you much about all the Stalin's uh, friends and comrades and colleagues from this era in these series, and some people have asked me why. Well, I want to set an example here why I haven't really bothered you with them much, and I will use Svanidze as a very typical example. Uh, you can basically apply his story as a template to anyone else in these series from this specific era. Svanidze was born in 1886. He got a good education in the Tsarist Russia, he knew English and German, he was in the same seminary as Stalin, he joined the Communist Party in, in 1901, lived in Germany for a while, and this is where Stalin visited him. After the Bolsheviks took power, Svanidze spent 1920 and 1921 working in the People's Commissariat of Foreign Affairs, and then, from 1921, worked as a People's Commissar of Finances in Georgian SSR. In 1924, he was assigned as the Soviet trade ambassador in Germany, and after his return to the USSR in 1935, became the vice chairman of the Internal Trade Bank of the Soviet Union. At the same time, Svanidze continued his scientific work because he was really intelligent. He created and worked as an editor in this small inconspicuous magazine called <clears throat> Ancient History News. Yes, he was a history geek, and you know, his study seems pretty nice so far. Because, for example, in the memories of other people from this era, it is remembered that he was such a great friend of Stalin, that he even tended to sleep over at Stalin's place often in the 1930s, and that they used to drink together. So far so good, right? Well, obviously he was arrested during the purge. 
1937. He was held in a KGB prison from December of 1937 until December of 1940. And if you want to know what that's like, go listen to my Gulag series, or, you know, those people who have visited Latvia and whom I have brought to the KGB museum know that uh, it's not a very, very nice place to be in. Anyhow, on the 4th of December 1940, the military collegiate of the Soviet Supreme Court made a verdict sentencing Alexander Svanidze to death, with a confiscation of property, of course. He was sentenced for various made-up crimes, and one of them was, well, for example, organizing a national Georgian mafia in 1922 to overthrow the Soviet government and other nonsense like this. During the court, he refused to confess about being a German spy in exchange for life imprisonment which was offered to him. In the 23rd of January 1941, after a protest by the vice chairman of the court, Vasily Ulrich, the plenum of the court exchanged his sentence from death to 15 years of prison. However, his best buddy Stalin didn't like this very much, so he told Ulrich that someone needs to get shot here and someone will get shot here. So, a bit later, in the 20th of August of the same year, again by the protest of Ulrich, the court shifted the sentence back to death. And Svanidze was shot the very same day by personal order of Beria. Yeah, this is this is the default story. They all either got killed, committed suicide, or were sent to gulags. Those very few of his comrades from this period who actually managed to survive the revolution and the purges mostly defected to Western countries, and I'm using their mem- memoirs as sources for this podcast. Now, of course, there were few that actually were cunning enough to be on the right side of the NKVD guys, Uh, mostly people who were doing mass executions themselves, such as Khrushchev, but they're actually prominent enough that we will get to them eventually. For the most part, if I don't go into live details of someone, it is because they they are forcibly dead before they manage to really do anything in the USSR, or, you know, kill themselves. Anyhow, back to the main plot. Stalin, after the Congress, went and visited his best friend forever, Svanidze, and returned home to Tbilisi in the early July. At this time, Svanidze's wife, Alexandra Semyonova, who was in Tbilisi at the time, remembers, <clears throat> quote, When Soso returned, we didn't recognize him. In Stockholm, comrades forced him to buy a suit, a fedora hat, and a new pipe. He looked like a real European. This was the first time we ever saw him being dressed this good. And from now until November of 1906, the official biographies state that Stalin led the Union of Professional Workers typographies in Tbilisi and wrote a lot in newspapers and started new ones. Of course, I could go through the most important articles he wrote at the time, as I have done previously, and the whole literal history here, but you know what? I have recently received some actual feedback telling me that I have become a bit too literal and that there was something charming in my earlier episodes, so you know, time to go back to the basics a bit. (laughs) And, you know, that make this whole thing interesting. But I do have to admit that I would love to do more interesting personal stuff more often, as this episode is gonna get really fun. But hey, if you don't know the context and all the cool reasons why and weird events stuff makes no sense, and we have only finally arrived at the place where real questions can be asked, and we where, where we have some actual serious documentation. Which isn't just he wrote this and that and there. So... Now, it's a good time to look a bit closer at two things. Number one, the extra-parliamentary activities that the comrades discussed in the Congress. And number two, why exactly Stalin was so obsessed with journalism and the presses? See, during and after these troubles in 1905, the Bolsheviks' principal resource was basically criminal action. Robbery and, well, various protection rackets. It should be recalled that political robbery was a really cool thing to do throughout the early 20th century Europe, where basically terrorist action was much more widespread than it is in in modern day. Political crime and assassination was higher by far than, you know, anything that we've heard today. And, And really, our acts of terrorism are, well, they happen, but they're actually way less frequent than then. For example... There were 121 terrorist acts in Russia alone in October 1906. 362 expropriations, how they called armed robberies, and 47 shootouts with the police. The forces of law and order suffered about 500 casualties per month. 
the Bolshevik readiness to resort to criminal action, and later to high treason, kind of illustrates the significance the party attached to ideology. And Alex de Jong here writes, mm, In order to accelerate the coming of the radiant future, any and all means were justified. To permit scruples to limit the scope of one's service to humanity would be an un unforgivable weakness. And I'll remind you that Alex de Jong writes his book in 1986, and he adds the following interesting thing, which proved to be very, in very interesting while I was doing this research. <clears throat> Quote, Although belief in a radiant future no longer plays much part in Soviet ideology today, the relationship between ends and means remains unaltered. Today's leaders still behave as if their actions were justified by the promise of the millennium, enabling them to eva invade Afghanistan or shoot down Korean airliners for the good of the cause. Lenin's ruthless idealism created a legacy of ruthlessness which long outlived the ideals themselves. And I would like to add here that this probably goes for the modern-day Russian government as well. Now, Stalin's role in these criminal activities is not really publicly recorded. He was moving in a zone beyond the reach of both of the record and kind of, you know, reminiscence about these things. We have some scrap of evidence, really, and, and this hasn't changed uh, since, since the 1986 or, or Soviet era, really that Stalin played a part of the organization, if not the actu actu actual execution of political murders. One of his early biographers quotes from the unpublished memoirs of an ex-revolutionary Alipi Sintanze, quote, After the defeat of the revolution, a period of dark reaction set in. Early in 1906, comrade Arsen Georgiachvili was ordered to kill Gen General Gryaznov, a terrible reactionary, ordered by the government to crush the revolutionary movement in Georgia. He kept postponing the execution. Koba, Stalin, came to me and said, If Georgiachvili does not murder Gryaznov within a week, you are to take it on, and you will need to pick up some terrorists to help you out in this matter. But Georgiachvili, well, he did the job. While Stalin watched coolly from the sidelines, the young terrorist bombed the general to death, was arrested, tried on the spot, and hanged in the main square at the dawn of the following day. No moral scruples whatsoever. The part played by Stalin in expropriations really remains a matter for conjecture, but there is kind of very little doubt that he really did do things in there. It is scarcely even thinkable that he couldn't have done it as he wanted to control everything and be a part of all of these criminal activities as he had specifically planned them and spoken about them previously and in these congresses and he will do so further on in the future. Besides, he was just a very criminal character and he had this strong affection for the criminal world, his nickname Cobb being from this criminal world, and you know, he was also very popular in that 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 uh, that zone, so to speak, if I can use a pun here. Because as we have mentioned previously, he used to organize pre prison riots and was very well known in the criminal underground of Tsarist Russia. There is another reason to suppose that he devoted a large part of his time to criminal activity. Namely, the sketchiness of all these biographies, the official ones that I keep reading and comparing to everything that I do here. Basically, his, ofi his official biographies bring him into kind of this occasional focus, only just to have him drift away almost immediately. <laughs> In the Soviet Union, the, the traditional practice of writing biographies for famous people, for all these... I don't know, Americans would call them founding father fathers. In the Soviet, they would be called the great revolutionaries of the past. See, they, they knew specifically where everyone was at the given moment. Their biographies used to be very precise and accounting basically for an hour of everything. But when it comes to Stalin, his biographies was very hazy, and that's why I need to use a lot of them. And Stalin edited them, edited them, edited them personally as well. So it's kind of very, very, very difficult to figure out what exactly Stalin did in a way that he really didn't want to be done. And this will come into play later on, because another evidence of Stalin messing, <laughs> messing up the evidence, so to speak, and messing up the whole historical record. And the second thing is um, Stalin's journalistic ambitions. And, and this may explain the interest he now displayed in a clandestine printing press that the Social Democrats had established in Tbilisi, which he's, he's running by now. 
See, setting up a press at that point was a major undertaking. I mean, he didn't have internet and he just couldn't start making a podcast about his own life and, you know, beating me to it or something. And he couldn't just write a blog. This time it was all about the presses. For example, it was impossible to purchase a a font of characters without a specific license. They had to be stolen from a legitimate print shop, which Stalin had did with his armed gangs. Another of the another of these nice expropriations, really. The press, which had been running successfully for some years, uh, which he now runs, employed six typesetters and published papers and pamphlets in Georgian, Armenian, and Russian. But the whereabouts of the press were known only to members of the local committee. It was set under a house and reached by a tunnel at the bottom of a well shaft. The police had been looking for it a long time when in the words of the owner of the house beneath which it was located, quote, <clears throat> On April 15, 1906, the gendarmes, the police, a squad of sappers, and a company of mounted Cossacks surround- surrounded the, R- the Rostomashvili house. Two state attorneys and the chief of the Tbilisi police were there also. As soon as the gendarmes arrived, they went straight to a corner of the yard where they dug up two bombs. They were most certainly tipped off by an insider, since they went directly to the place where they found the bombs. They then dug the whole yard up, but found nothing more. After a discussion, the chief ordered them to abandon the search and leave. As they moved off on their way past the great hole, a sapper officer lit a newspaper and threw it down. The burning paper was sucked down quickly. One of the attorneys drew attention to it and ordered a man sent down to investigate. They they let a Cossack down on a rope. From the bottom, he announced that he had found a door. More men were let down, who broke the door in and discovered the press. Now, there are rumors that suggest that Stalin had tried to gain control of the press previously, and that when he failed, he took the appropriate measures to close it down. The officials officials certainly behaved as if they wished to protect an inside source, discovering the press by chance at the last moment. Stalin's role is a matter of debate here, obviously, because despite the efforts to track it down, the press had operated successfully for a long time, and it was discovered shortly after Stalin's arrival. There's nothing far-fetched about the notion that Stalin had reported its whereabouts to the authorities. The motive? A combination of pleasure and profit, or so my sources state. Trotsky will later maintain that Stalin was actually arrested during the raid and then released. That would scarcely have been possible since he was out of the country at the time. Arseniza suggests that Trotsky got his dates confused and that Stalin had already been arrested and released before the press was discovered, the presumption being that his information bought the police off. But this is this is the weirdest part because he will he he will take control of these presses and will run these these unions and everything, and maybe he tried to kind of buy off this whole press thing. Maybe he was trying to trying to actually gain more control and kind of expose some insiders of the party. At any rate, he will continue running all these presses up until November. But, but, there is a person that appears in our story here that will actually become important later. <clears throat> Yekaterina Kato Svanidze. Guess what? She is the sister of the same best body of Stalin that we spoke about, who is in Germany at this time. You see, in the night from the 15th and the 16th of July, 1906, in the Church of St. David, in a secret, in secret, she's married to Stalin by an ex mate of his, Stalin's, that is, from the seminary, uh, Christis Tchinvali. Now, Svanidze, due to conspiracy reasons, doesn't change uh, her surname here, as Stalin, after all, is being actively searched by the cops because he's a terrorist and a socialist leader and has escaped from prisons many times... And yeah, you might have forgotten that with him traveling around and doing all sorts of crazy shenanigans, but he is still very much a wanted man. That is escaped from Siberia. Twice now. Also, it is well known and documented, and this will become really important later, that Stalin actually really, really loved his first wife. According to himself, quote, She was the only one that could warm my stone-cold heart. And he loved her so much that he even agreed to this church wedding that she wanted, even though he was obviously a staunch atheist. But, back to November now. In the 13th of November, cops arrived at Stalin's apartment in Tbilisi, Freylinskaya Street, number 3, while he was visiting away in Baku. 
they conducted a thorough search of the apartment and arrested his, by now, pregnant in the fourth month, newlywed wife. She was formally charged with the very simple fact that, you know, she had hidden her marriage to Stalin and, you know, had shown her now useless passport with her maiden name and previous registered address, where our nice comrade Jugashvili wasn't obviously mentioned. According to protocols, they also confiscated <clears throat> two five-pud bags of books. A pud is an old weight measurement used in Tsarist Russia, weighing in about uh, 16.4 kilograms or 36.1 pounds. That is, they took with them 164 kilos or 361 pounds worth of illegal literature. Which is super fun, as it reminds me of what I'll have to do when I'll move again and it doesn't really feel very comfortable. At any rate, Stalin's wife is released after a month and a half in the 29th of December under bail to her relatives. And to probably one of the most wanted men in the Soviet Union. See, our pal Koba is there, pretending to be her cousin in the police station. Yes, he, while being one of the most wanted men on, on the Soviet Union, during which all the conspiracy wedding was organized, he went to the cops to bail his wife out, pretending to be the cousin. Just just think about the chutzpah of this guy for a second and be amazed. And terrified. Very, very, very terrified. Anyhow, Stalin continues his journalism work in various newspapers until the 18th of March, 1907, when his firstborn son, Yakov, is born. We will mention him again in the future, but to do so now would actually spoil some of the fun elements of the whole story. After that, Stalin decides that it's time for him to travel around again a bit. After all, there is the upcoming 5th Congress of the party, this time in London, and Stalin just has to be there. In the meantime, by the way, while traveling through Denmark, he visits Berlin once again for a hidden meeting with our old comrade Lenin to discuss the planned robberies in the future. One specific robbery, to be exact, that they are planning together. So, from the 30th of April to the 19th of May, Stalin participated in this 5th Congress of uh, the Russian Social Democratic Party in London and later visited Paris a week. Apparently, he went to the Louvre as well, because he will then, later on in his life, tell about this visit. But this... this is not that important, really. What is important is that during this Congress, the Bolshevik and Menshevik factions of the party really clash against each other. The Bolsheviks argued in favor for preparations for an armed uprising against Tsarist rule, which Menshevik leader Julius Martov denounces as Putschist. Another disagreement was how the party should basically relate to the trade union movement. The Mensheviks argued for creating a workers' congress as a first step towards transforming the party in a, in a West European style sort of legal sort of social democratic party, because by this point everything in Russia is just their little groups sparking things everywhere. Another debated issue was, uh, guess what? <clears throat> Expropriations. As I mentioned earlier, to support their political activities, the, this party and other revolutionary groups in Russia, like the Socialist Revolutionary Party, which is independent from Lenin at this point, or Stalin, and also various anarchist factions, they use these expropriations, armed robberies of government offices or businesses or whomever they liked, <clears throat> to fund them. Lenin and the most militant Bolsheviks really supported continuing these things, after all, he had just planned one with Stalin on the way to this Congress, while the Mensheviks advocated a non-violent approach to revolution. So, the 5th Congress passed a revolution which condemned participation in, or assistance to, all violent activity, including expropriations, as, <clears throat> quote, disorganizing and demoralizing, end quote, and called for, for all party militias to be disbanded. <laughs> yeah, they really thought this was gonna happen, didn't they? This resolution passed with 65% supporting and 6% opposing. The others abstained or did not vote. All Mensheviks and even some Bolsheviks voted in favor. That will totally pay out for Mensheviks, I tell you. Now, the fun part is that, ironically, uh, one of the most famous expropriations, the 1907 Tbilisi bank robbery, was organized and took place just a tiny bit after this vote. Now, there are many, many stories about this robbery and Stalin's role in it. For example, Pavlenko claims that Stalin attacked the carriage itself and had been wounded by a bomb fragment. 
Another source, Kamo, later states that Stalin took no active part in the robbery and had watched it from a distance. There are also sources who state in a police report later on that Stalin, quote, observed the ruthless bloodshed smoking a cigarette from the courtyard of a mansion, end quote. Some claim that Stalin was actually at the railway station during the robbery and not at the square. Stalin's sister-in-law states that Stalin came home the night of the robbery and told his family about its success. And what complicates this even more is that in the 1920s, Stalin, just before he became the supreme leader, Stalin went to remarkable lengths to conceal his role in these expropriations. See, in 1923 to 1924, his chief gangster, Kobet Sintzaze, by then in opposition to Stalin, published his memoirs in a small Georgian journal. They were republished in 1927, but afterwards, the pages involving Stalin's part in the assassinations and robberies were removed, a process continuing in the 1930s under Beria himself. And access to these materials is ridiculously hard. Not even kidding, not even, they're, they're not on the internet, really, if, if you wondered, so... Um, it's really difficult to pinpoint this, and I'm sorry if this little paragraph made no sense, it will be explained, don't worry. I wanted to say with this that we are left with many, many, many stories. And this whole thing is heavily debated, so one has to, has to make a choice, really. You have to make... you have to pick your sources. And my choice for the most believable sequence of events come from Stalin's biography, written by Simon Seabag Montefiore. Which is the story that I will be using in this next part about the robbery, but just know that all of this is really heavily contested. So here we go. Now imagine this, it's 10.30 a.m. It's morning, Wednesday, 26th June 1907. And the central square of Tbilisi is, like, full with people. And one certain dashing mustachioed cavalry captain in boots and jodhpurs, wielding a big circassian saber, st performs tricks on horseback. He's joking with two pretty, well-dressed Georgian girls, while fi <clears throat> uh, who, who are, like, <clears throat> who twirled gaudy parasols while fingering Mauser pistols hidden in their dresses. Raffish young men in bright peasant blouses and wide sailor-style trousers waited on the street corners, cradling secret, re secret revolvers and grenades. At the Luz Tilipurishi tavern on the square, a crew of heavily armed gangsters took over the cellar bar, gaily inviting passers-by to join them for drinks. All of them were waiting to carry out the first exploit by Joseph Jugashvili, age 29, later known as Stalin, to win the attention of the world. Few outside of the gang knew of the plan that day for a criminal terrorist spectacular, but Stalin had worked on it for months. One man who didn't know the board plan was Lenin, who was at this time hiding in Villa in Kuokola, Finland, which is, well, far, far north. See, like I said, he had previously met to, pl to plan all this situation in Berlin, and then they had spoken about it in London a bit. See, even though all this was just banned, Stalin's operations, however, heists and killings were always conducted with, <clears throat> quote, meticulous attention to detail and secrecy, which by this point had made him the main financier of the Bolshevik Center, so he really couldn't care less about whatever the Mensheviks had decided in this London Congress. And what happened that day would really, that was on the first headlines all over the globe. It would literally shake Tbilisi to its foundations, and it would further drive a huge wedge in between the social between the social democratic party splitting it into Mensheviks and Bolsheviks. This day would also both make Stalin's career and almost ruin it. it was, this is certainly a watershed moment in his life. Now, <clears throat> in the central Yerevan square, the 20, 20 robbers who were the core of Stalin's gang, and the gang was known as the Outfit at the time, they took up positions as their lookouts peered down Golovinsky Prospect, which is the elegant main street of Tbilisi. This was past the splendor of Viceroy's Palace, and it's like the main street and on this square. So, they were waiting for a stagecoach and a squadron of Cossacks. The army captain with the Circassian saber was caracoled around on his horse before dismounting to stroll the fashionable boulevard. Every street corner was guarded by a Cossack or policeman. The authorities were ready. 
Something had been expected since January. The informers and agents of the Tsar's secret police, the Ochranka, and his uniformed political police, the gendarmes, delivered copious reports about the clandestine plots and feuds of the gangs of revolutionaries and criminals. In the misty twilight of this underground, the worlds of bandits and terrorists had merged, and it was hard to tell tricks from truth. But there had been chatter about a spectacular for months now. Now, on that morning, the Tbilisi hardly seemed to belong to the same world as the Tsarist capital Petersburg. The older streets without running water or, or electricity wound up the slopes of Satiminda, the holy mountain, until they were impossibly steep, full of crookedly picturesque houses weighted down with balconies and twined with old wines. Oh my, he's really poetic here. I'm trying to comment on this text as I go, mind you. Tbilisi was just a big village where everyone knew everyone else. Just behind the military headquarters on Gentil Frelinskaya Street, hey, Frelinskaya, the number three where Stalin lived, a thrown stove from the square lived Stalin's wife. Oh, well, yeah. <clears throat> and at this point, even though his wife was, like we said, very, very, very young and, and like, shared his Rushni fervor, <sighs> this will also leave a huge mark on her and on her son. See, this whole Tbilisi was the capital of the Caucasus, as you know. This uh, was the Tsar's, <clears throat> so-called the Tsar's, wild, mountainous viceroyalty between the Black and the Caspian Seas, a turbulent region of fierce and feuding peoples. Golovinsky Prospect seemed almost Parisian in its elegance. White neoclassical theaters, a Moorish-style opera house, grand hotels and the palaces of Georgian princes and Armenian oil barons lined the street. But as one passed the military headquarters, Yerevan Square opened up into an Asi Asiatic potpourri. Exotically dressed hawkers in stalls offered spicy Georgian lobio beans and hot hachapuri cheesecake. By the way, hachapuri cheesecake is something that you should totally, definitely try, because it's awesome. Water carriers, street traders, pickpockets and porters delivered to or stole from the Armenian and Persian bazaars, the alleyways of which more resembled the Levantine Sauk than a European city. Caravans of camels and donkeys loaded with silks and spices from Persia and Turkestan, fruit and wine skins from the lush Georgian countryside, ambled through the gates of a caravanserai. Its young waiters and errand boys served its clientele of guests and diners, carrying in the bags and harnessing the camels and watching the square. Now we know from the newly opened Georgian archives that uh, Stalin, fagin like used the caravanserai boys as a pre-pubescent -pu revolutionary street intelligence and counter service. Meanwhile, of one of the Caravanserai's cavernous bar back rooms, the chief gangsters gave their gunmen a pep talk, rehearsing the plan one last time. Stalin himself was there that morning. And this is the part which is obviously contested, but uh, I have picked my narrative and you will have to, excuse me, go with this this time. The two pretty teenage girls with thrill twirling umbrellas and loaded revolvers, Patti Sagoldava and Anneta Sulakavidze, Quote, brown haired swelled with black eyes that expressed youth, end quote. Casually shade th across the square to stand outside the military headquarters where they flirted with Russian officers, gendarmes in smart blue uniforms, and bow legged Cossacks. Tbilisi was, and still is, a languid town of strollers and boulevardiers who frequently stopped to drink wine at the many open air taverns. If the showily excitable Georgians resemble any other European people, it's the Italians. Georgians and other Caucasian men in traditional chol and choka, their skirted long coats lined down the chest with bullet pouches, swaggered down the street, singing loudly. Georgian women in black headscarves and the wives of Russian officers in European fashions promenaded through the gates of the Pushkin Gardens, buying ices and sherbet alongside Persians and Armenians, Chechens, Abkhaz and Mountain Jews, in, in a fancy dress jamboree of hats and costumes. Gangs of street urchins, Kintos, furtively scanned the crowns for scams. Teenage trainee priests in long white surplices were escorted by their berobed, bearded priest teachers from the pillared white seminary across the street. This unslavic, un-Russian and ferociously Caucasian kaleidoscope of East and West was the world that nurtured Stalin. Checking the time, the girls Anneta and Patsia parted, taking up new positions on either side of the square. On Palace Street, the dubious clientele of the notorious Tilichipuri Tavern, princes, pimps, informers and pickpockets, while were already drinking Georgian wine and Armenian brandy, not far from the plutocratic grandeur of Prince Sumbatov's place. 
Just then, David Sagriashvili, another revolutionary who knew Stalin and some of the gangsters, visited a friend who owned a shop above the tavern and was invited by the cheerful brigand in the doorway, Bachua Kupirashvili, who, quote, immediately offered me a chair and a glass of red wine according to the Georgian custom. David drank the wine and was about to leave when the gunman suggested, with exquisite politeness, that he stay inside and sample more snacks and wine. David realized they were letting people into the restaurant, but would not let them out. Armed individuals stood at the door. Spotting the convoy galloping down the boulevard, Patsia Goldava, the slim brunette on lookout, sped round the corner to the Pushkin Gardens where she waved her newspaper to Stepko Intrishvili, waiting by the gate. We're off, she muttered. Stepko nodded at Anna Tasula Ketvide, who was across the street just outside the Tilipuchuri, where she made a sign summoning the others from the bar. The gunman in the doorway beckoned them. At a given signal, Sagriashvili saw the brigands in the tavern put down their drinks, cock their pistols and head out, spreading across, across the square. Thin, consumptive young men in white trousers who had barely eaten for weeks. Some were gangsters, some desperados, and some, typically for Georgia, were poverty-stricken princes from roofless, wallless castles in the provinces. If their deeds were criminal, they cared nothing for money. They were devoted to Lenin, the party, and um, their puppet master in Tbilisi, Stalin. The functions of, us, for, of each of us had been planned in advance, remembered the third girl in the gang, Alexandra Darakejesvila. Just 19, a friend of Annette and already a veteran of spree of heist and shootouts. The gangsters each covered the square's policemen, the Gorodovoy, known in the streets as pharaohs. Uh, I guess they would be called Nazis this time, because I know that pharaoh was previously used for uh, things that we call Nazis today. They, they were the big evil. Two gunmen marked the Cossacks outside the city hall, the rest made their way to the corner of El Vilyaminov Street and the Armenian Bazaar, not far from the state bank itself. Alexandra Dakarejvile, in her unpublished memoirs, replaced, recalled guarding one of the street corners with two gunmen. Now, Bachua Kupirashvili, nonchalantly pretending to read the newspaper, spotted in the distance the cloud of dust thrown up by the horse's hooves. They were coming! Bachua rolled up his newspaper, poised... And the cavalry captain with a flashing saber, who had been promenading the square, now warned passers-by to stay out of it. But when no one paid any attention, he jumped back onto his fine horse. He was no officer, but the ideal of the Georgian Beu Sabur, an outlaw, half-knight, half-bandit. This was Kamo, age 25. Boss of the outfit, and as Stalin put it, a master of disguise, who could pass for a rich prince or a peasant laundry woman. He moved stiffly, his half-blind left eye squinting and rolling. One of his own bombs had exploded in his face just weeks before. He was still, re still recuperating. Now, Kamo, <clears throat> quote, was completely enthralled, end quote, by Stalin, who had converted him to Marxism. They had grown up together in the violent town of Gori, 45 miles away. He was a bank robber of ingenious audacity, a Houdini of prison escapes, a credulous simpleton, and a half-insane practitioner of psychopathic violence. Intensely, eerily tranquil, with a weird, lusterless face and a blind gaze, he was keen to serve his master, often begging Stalin, Let me kill him for you! No need of macabre horror or courageous flamboyance was beyond him. He later plunged, plunged his hand into a man's chest and cut out his heart. You know, typical for revolutionaries at the time. Throughout his life, by the way, Stalin's detached magnetism would attract and win the devotion of immoral, unbounded psychopaths. His boyhood henchmen Kamo and these gangsters were the first in a very long time. Those young men followed Stalin selflessly. Their admiration for him allowed him to impose on them his iron discipline. Kamo often visited Stalin's home where he had earlier borrowed Ka Ka Kato's fa father's saber, explaining that he was going to play an officer of the Cossacks. Even Lenin, raised as a nobleman, was fascinated by the daredevil Kamo, whom he called his Caucasian bandit. Kamo amused Stalin in old age, was a truly amazing person. Captain Kamo turned his horse towards the boulevard and trotted audaciously right past the advancing convoy, coming the other way. Once the shooting started, he boasted the whole thing would be over in three minutes. The Cossacks galloped into Yerevan Square, two in front, two behind and another alongside the two carriages. Through the dust, the gangsters could make out that the stagecoach contained two men in frock coats, the state, the state bank's cashier Kudrumov and an accountant Golovnya and two soldiers with rifles cocked, while a second phaeton was packed with police and soldiers. In the thunder of hooves, it took just seconds for the carriages and the horsemen to cross the square ready to turn into Sololaki Street, where stood the new state bank. The statues of lions and gods over its door represented the surging prosperity of Russian capitalism. 
Macho lowered his newspaper, giving the sign, then tossed it aside, reaching for, for his weapons. The gangsters drew out what they nicknamed their apples. Powerful grenades, which had been smuggled into Tbilisi by the girls Annette and Alexandra, hidden inside a big sofa. The gunmen and the girls stepped forward, pulled the fuses and tossed four grenades, which exploded under the carriages with a deafening noise and the infernal force that disemboweled horses and tore men to pieces, spattering the cobbles with innards and blood. The brigands drew their Mauser and Browning pistols and opened fire on the Cossacks and police around the square, who, caught totally unawares, fell wounded or ran for cover. More than ten bombs exploded. Witnesses thought they rained from every direction, even the rooftops. It was later said that Stalin had, by the way, thrown the first bomb from the roof of, roof of Prince Sumbatov's mansion. Which, again, is heavily debated, but this is... This is what happens in this narrative. The bank carriage is stopped. Screaming passers-by scrambled for cover. Some thought it was an earthquake. Was Holy Mountain falling on the city? No one can tell if the terrible shooting was the boom of cannons or explosion of bombs, reported the Georgian newspaper Isari or Arrow. The sound caused panic everywhere. Um, almost across the whole city, people started running. Carriages and carts were galloping away. Chimneys had toppled from buildings. Every pane of, pla pane of glass was shattered as far as the Viceroy's palace. Kato Svanidze was standing on her nearby balcony, telling Stalin's, tending Stalin's baby with her family. Quote, when all of a sudden we heard the sound of bombs, recall, recalled her sister Shashiko. Terrified, we rushed into the house. Outside, amid the yellow smoke and the wild chaos, among the bodies of horses and mutilated limbs of men, something had gone wrong. One horse attached to the front carriage twitched, then jerked back to life. Just as the ganger gangsters ran to seize the money bags in the back of the carriage, the horse reared up out of the mayhem and bolted down the hill towards the soldiers' bazaar, disappearing with the money that Stalin had promised Lenin for the revolution. During the ensuing century, Stalin's role that day was suspected yet unprovable. But now the, the archives in Moscow and Tbilisi show how he masterminded the operation and groomed his inside men within the bank over many months. Now that is true. The unpublished memoirs of his sister-in-law, Shashiko Svanidze, in the Georgian archives record Stalin openly acknowledging that he presided over the operation. A century after the heist, it is now possible to reveal the truth. Now, yeah, he really did plan it, but again, contested whether or not he was there personally. But I don't think it really matters that much, because this is a work of a criminal mastermind. Stalin revelled in the dirty business of politics, the conspirational drama of revolution, you see. When he will become later the big guy, the general secretary of Soviet Union, he will basically nostalgically even sometimes talk about these events, <clears throat> like games of Cossacks and Bandits. Uh, Kazaki Razbojnik, which is basically the Russian version of Cops and Robbers. But he never gives us any details, as mentioned previously, actively tried to eliminate them. Now, at this point, the Stalin of 1907 was a small, whirly, mysterious man, of many aliases, as we have mentioned in these series, and he usually was dressed in a red satin shirt, grey coat, and his trademark black fedora, which he had also just purchased in 1907. <clears throat> Sometimes he favored the traditional Georgian choka, you know, that, that Georgian hat, and he liked to sport a white Caucasian hood draped thrashingly over his shoulder. Always in the move, often on the run, he used the many uniforms of Tsarist society as his disguises, and frequently escaped his manhunts by dressing in drag. I would love to see Stalin in drag one day, but sadly, no, we don't have photos of this. But it would truly be amazing. Attractive to women, often singing Georgian melodies and declaiming po poetry, because, you know, he also was a poet. He was charismatic and humorous, yet profoundly morose, an odd Georgian with a northern coldness. His burning eyes were honey-fleckled with friendly, yellow when angry. He had not yet settled on the mustache and hair and brass of his prime. He sometimes grew a full beard and long hair, still with the auburn tinge of his youth now darkening. Freckled and pockmarked, he walked, walked fast but crookedly and held his left arm stiffly. You know, after all the nice incidents, that basically took his left arm away. Indefatigable in action, he bubbled with ideas and ingenuity. Inspired by hunger, hunger for learning and an instinct to teach, he feverishly studied novels and history, but his love of letters was always overwhelmed by his drive to command and dominate, to vanish enemies and avenge slights. Yeah, this is true. Patient, calm and modest, he could also be vainglorious, pushy and thin-skinned, with outbursts of viciousness just a short fuse away. Oh, uh, in, this, in this, this episode's Ask Uncle Joe section, we will speak about his viciousness. Immersed in the honor and loyalty culture of Georgia, he was the gritty realist, the sarcastic cynic, and the pitless cutthroat par excellence. 
It was also he who had created the Bolshevik bank robber in the cessation outfit, all this the gang, which he controlled from afar like a mafia don. He cultivated the coarseness of a peasant trait which alienated his comrades, but usefully concealed his subtle gifts from snobby rivals. Happily married to Kato, he had chosen a heartless, wandering existence that, while he believed, liberated him from normal morality or responsibility. He was said to be free from love itself. Yet, while he wrote about the megalomania of others, he had no self-knowledge about his own drive for power. He loved being this secretive man. When he knocked on the doors of friends and they asked who was there, he would answer with mock pretentiousness, <clears throat> the man in grey. One of the first professional revolutionaries, the underground was his natural habitat, through which he moved with elusively feline grace and menace. A born extremist and conspirator, the man, of, the man in grey was a true believer, a Marxist fanatic. The violent rites of Stalin's secret planet of Caucasian conspiracy would later flower into all of his idiosyncratic ruling culture of the Soviet Union itself. Stalin had opened the era of the holdup wrote one of his fellow bank robbery masterminds, his, home, his hometown friend, Josef Dravichevny. Stalin, we used to believe, organized operations, but never took part personally. This may have been true that day in 1907, but we know that Stalin himself, usually armed with his Mauser, was more directly involved in other robberies. Then again, he might be involved in this robbery as well. He always kept his eyes skinned for the spectacular prize and knew that the best bank robberies are usually inside jobs. On this occasion, he had two inside men. First, he patiently groomed the useful bank clerk. Then he bumped into a school friend who happened to work for the banking mail office. Stalin cultivated him for months until he profited the tip that a huge sum of money, perhaps as much as a million rubles, would arrive in Tbilisi on 13th of June, 1907. If, if you're wondering why I say the 13th of June, remember the two-week dime difference. <clears throat> Because, you know, it happened in the old time of 13th of June, but in modern day, this would be the 26th one. The key inside man afterwards revealed that he had helped set up this colossal heist only because he was such an admirer of Stalin's romantic poetry. Only in Georgia could Stalin the poet enable Stalin the gangster, really. So, <clears throat> the runaway horse of the carriage and its booty bolted across the square. Some of the gangsters panicked, but three gunmen moved with astonishing speed. Bacio Kupriashvili kept his head and sprinted towards the horse. He was too close for his own safety, but he tossed another apple under its belly, tearing out its intestines and blowing off its legs. Thrown into the air, Bacio fell stunned to the cobbles. The carriage careened to a halt. Bacio was out of action, but Datiko Chibirashvili jumped out to, uh, onto the coach and pulled out the sacks of money. Ripping the money bags, he staggered through the smoke towards Velyaminov Street. But the gang was in disarray. Datiko could not run far, holding the weight of the banknotes. He must hand them over. But to whom? The drifting smoke parted to reveal carnage, worthy of a small battlefield. Screams and shots still rent the air as blood spread across cobbles strewn with body parts. Cossacks and soldiers started to peep out, reaching for their weapons. Reinforcements were on their way from across the city. All the comrades, will later write Bacia Kuprishvili, were up to the mark, except three who had weak nerves and ran off. Yet Datiko found himself momentarily almost alone. He hesitated. The success of the plan ran by a thread. Now, did Stalin really throw the first bomb from the roof of, of Prince Zumbatov's house? Like I said previously, Pavlenko, one of the dictators, dictators, page writers, as he's called here, and yeah, well, Pavlenko was one of the more famous Soviet Soviet guys, uh, claimed that Stalin had attacked the carriage himself and been wounded by a bomb fragment. But this seems unlikely. Stalin usually held himself afar, apart from everyone else in all matters for security reasons and because he always regarded himself as special, but... Again, disputed everything. In the 1920s, according to Georgian sources, Kamo would drunkenly claim that Stalin had taken no active part but could watch the robbery, a report confirmed by another questionable source connected to the police, who wrote that Stalin really observed this thing whole, well, this whole thing while smoking a cigarette. Perhaps the mansion was indeed Prince Sumbatov's. The boulevard's milk bars, taverns, cobblers, hairdressers, and haberdashers crawled out with Ochranka and uh, crawled with Ochranka informers. Most likely, the Stalin, the clandestine master who specialized in sudden appearances and vanishings, was out of the way before the shooting started. Indeed, the most informed source puts puts him in the railway station that mid-morning. 
Oh boy. Well, yeah, I mentioned this the second time, but all of this is debated because Stalin edited his own personal histories. Anyhow, just as the robbery was about to collapse, Captain Kamo rides into the square driving his own phaeton. He reins in one hand and he fires his mauser with the other. And he's furious that this whole plan has failed and he's cursing at the top of his voice mm, like a real captain. And we all, all, everyone who's lived in the Soviet Union knows what this means. So he whirls his carriage round and round and effectively is taking possession of this whole square thing. Then he gallops up to the Tico, he leans down and, you know, he's aided by one of these gun girls and he basically just heaves the sacks of money with his phaeton. He turns the carriage prick up, he turns the carriage very carefully round and gallops back up the boulevard right past the Viceroy's palace, which is basically buzzing with troops now. Cossacks settled up and orders for reinforcements were dispatched. Kamo noticed a police fight on cantering around in the opposite direction, bearing Balabansky, the deputy police chief. The money is safe, run to the square, shouted Kamo. Balabansky headed for the square. Only the next day did Balabansky realize his mistake. Oh, Balabansky committed suicide just after that. Kamo rode straight to Vtoraya Goncharnaya Street and into the yard of a joiner's shop behind a house owned by an old lady named Barbara Babe Bochoridze. Here, with Babe's son, Micha, Stalin had spent many nights over the years. Here, the robbery had been planned. It was an address well known to the local police, but the gangsters had suborned at least one gendarme officer, Captain Zubo, who was later indicted for taking bribes and even helping to hide the spoils. Kamo, exhausted, delivered the money, changed out of his uniform, and poured a bucket of water over his sweltering head. The shockwaves of Stalin's spectacular, uh, spectacular reverberated around the world. In London, the Daily Mirror announced <clears throat> Rain of bombs, revolutionaries hurl destruction among large crowds of people. Quote, About ten bombs were hurled today, one after another in the square, uh, square in the center of town thronged with people. The bombs exploded with terrific force, many being killed. The Times, by the way, just called it Tbilisi Bomb Outrage. Le Temps in Paris was more laconic. Catastrophe. Blissy was in uproar, the usually genial viceroy of the Caucasus, Count Voronsov Dashkov, ranted about the insolence of the terrorists. The, quote, administration and army are mobilized, announced Isari, the local newspaper. Police and patrol launched, launched searches across the city. Many have been arrested. St. Petersburg was outraged. The security forces were ordered to find the money and the robbers. A special detective and his team were dispatched to head the investigation. Roads were closed. Yerevan Square was surrounded, while Cossacks and gendarmes rounded up the usual suspects. Every informer, every double agent was tapped for information, and duly delivered a Farago versions, none of them actually fingering real culprits. 20,000 rubles had been left in the carriage. A surviving carriage driver who thought he had who who thought he had gotten lucky pocketed another nine thousand five hundred rubles, but he was arrested with it later. He knew nothing about the Stalin and the Kamal gang. A jabbering woman gave herself up as one of the bank robbers, but turned out to be insane. No one could guess how many robbers there had been. Witnesses thought there were up to fifty gangsters raining bombs from the roofs, if not from Holy Mountain. No one actually saw Kamal take the banknotes. The Okhranka heard stories from all over Russia that the robbery was variously arranged by the state itself, by Polish socialists, by anarchists from Rosnov, by Armenian Dashnaks, or by the socialist revolutionaries. None of the gangsters were caught. Even Kupriashvili regained consciousness just in time to hobble away. In the chaotic aftermath, they, scra they just fled to every direction, they were melting into the crowds. One, Eliso Lominadze, who had been covering a street corner with Alexandra, slipped into a teacher's conference, stole a teacher's uniform, and then nonchalantly wandered back to the square to admire his handiwork. Everyone survived it, said Alexandra Darkalishvidze, dictating her memoirs in 1959, by then the only member of the ill-fated gang still being alive. Fifty lay wounded in the square. The bodies of three Cossacks, the bank officials and some innocent passers-by lay in pieces. The censored newspapers kept casualties low, but the Ochranka's archives revealed that around 40 were killed. Dressing stations for the wounded were set up in nearby shops. 24 seriously wounded were taken to hospital. An hour later, passers-by saw the funeral progress of a ghoulish carriage carrying the dead and their body parts down Golovinsky, like the giblets from an abattoir. The state bank itself was unsure if it had lost 250,000 rubles or 341,000 rubles. Or somewhere between the two figures. But it was clearly an impressive sum, worth about $3.4 million in today's money, though its effective buying power was much, much higher. 
Bochoriza and his wife Maro, another of the female bank robbers, sued the money into a mattress. Svelte Mauser, toting, Svelte Mauser toting Patsia Goldava, then called porters, perhaps some of Stalin's urchins, and supervised its removal to another safe house across the river Kura. The mattress was then placed in the couch of the director of the Tbilisi Meteorological Observatory, where Stalin had lived and worked after leaving the seminary. I told you it was important. It was basically Stalin's last job before he, and only job, before he plunged into being a professional revolutionary. Well, <clears throat> later the director of this weather center kind of admitted that he really never had known what fridges were put there. Stalin himself, which a lot of sources state here, not just this one, uh, basically had helped to stow the cash in there. If this sounds like a myth, it's plausible, it transpires that, you know, he often handled stolen goods, and he was riding across the mountains with saddlebags full of cash from bank robberies and pirates anyway. Surprisingly, that night Stalin felt safe enough to go home to Kato and boast of this exploit to his family. His boys had done it. Well, mighty boast. The money was safe in the weatherman's mattress, and it would soon be on its way to Lenin. No one suspected Stalin, Stalin to even come home. The booty would be smuggled abroad, some of it even laundered through the cre Credit Lyonnais in Lyon. The police of a dozen nations were, would, would pursue cash and gangsters for months, with no success completely. For a couple of days after the heist, Stalin, as it's said, unsuspected of any connection to the robbery, was secure enough to drink in, uh, to drink in Riverside Taverns, but not for long. He had to tell suddenly his wife that they were leaving at once to start a new life in Baku. The oil bloom city on the other side of Caucasus. The devil knows, reflected the Tbilisi the New Times, how this unlikely audacious robbery was carried out. Stalin actually managed to pull off a perfect crime. The Tbilisi bank robbery turned out to be far from perfect. Indeed, it became a poison chalice. Afterwards, Stalin never lived in Tbilisi or, indeed, in George ever again. And the fate of Kamo, his main robbing man, would be insanely bizarre. The quest for the cash, some of which it turned out was in marked notes, would be tangled, but even these astonishing twists were far from the end of the matter for Stalin. The heist, the heist success was almost a disaster for him. The robbery's global notoriety became a powerful weapon against Lenin and against Stalin personally. The gangsters fell, fell out over the spoils. Lenin and his comrades fought for possession of the cash like basically rats in a cage. His enemies spent the next three years launching three separate party investigations hoping to ruin him. Stalin, already being persona non grata in Georgia, was just tainted even more by this brazen ignorance of all the party rules and all this reckless carnage. And this is the point where he got expelled from the party by the Tbilisi committee. This was basically a botch that would have, that would have derailed his bid to succeed Lenin, and it spoiled his ambition to become a Russian statesman and the supreme pontiff of Marxism. This thing, this whole event, it was so sensitive that even in 1918, Stalin launched an extra extraordinary libel case to suppress this whole story. His career as a gangster, godfather, audacious bank robber, killer, pirate, arsonist, everything, it was whispered at home and much enjoyed by, by the critics abroad, actually wasn't well known until the, like, the 21st century, until now. In the Soviet era, it was never spoken about, except, you know, in home where they were like, yeah, this guy was great. And it's kind of crazy, you should make a movie about this situation. In a, in a weird way, all this robbery basically made Stalin. Because Stalin had now basically proven himself, not only as a politician and a man who runs the presses, but also as a ruthless man of action. And he did it to the only guy who really mattered at the time. Lenin would later say that Stalin was exactly the kind of person that needed. And yeah, after the robbery, Stalin, his wife, and baby vanished from Tbilisi just two days later, but uh, he also did a lot of robberies later on. There were kind of new places to rob, new bank stuff, but this this Tbilisi just, just runs through the memory of everyone. And this was crazy. Stalin really just went on to the Russian steps from Georgia and left Georgia at this point and never looked back. But not all was good for Stalin because, uh, we, as we will mention in the next episode, he was about to about to get such a tragedy in his life, which basically finally completely transformed this murderous maniac into a supreme sociopath for whom no prize and, and no cost of human life and no obstacle would stand stand before him. 
nothing will, after what will happen in the next episode, will crush his ambitions and dreams. Nothing will stop Stalin. Stalin right now has proven himself to be worthy and tough. In the next episode, Stalin will truly, finally, become the Man of Steel. And that's about it of the robbery and of the general study for today. But we have one less. We, but we have one last segment to give you, and that is, of course, Ask Uncle Joe. And this week's Ask Uncle Joe question comes from none other than Dave Wallace himself. You probably recognize that name if you listen long enough. He's a very, very, very old-timey listener of ours since the first episode. Uh, hello, Dave. How's it going? Please visit us in Latvia one day. <laughs> Anyhow, his question is, <clears throat> So I have to ask Uncle Joe why he doesn't have near as many medals as the generals, and does that annoy him? And this is actually a quite a complex answer. <clears throat> you see, Stalin had only 14 medals in, in, in total. I'm pretty sure that your president, whichever country you live in, or your king or your queen, has way more than that. And he only wore a single one of those. He wore the single star of the hero of the Soviet Union, uh, the one which you can see the most of his portraits. Now, there are very few oil paintings of him wearing more orders and medals, but he didn't like them at all. Uh, he only wore this, this one. And this was because he thought that a <clears throat> complacent bastard is worse than the enemy. He didn't like people who were praising him openly and trying to be sycophants to a ridiculous degree. Like, he even sent a poet, Osip Mandelstam, to the far cold eastern Siberia, because Stalin got extremely tired of all the poems glorifying him that this Osip wrote in the hopes of being rewarded. And the final stroke here was when this poet wrote a massively long ode to Stalin, and then he just sent him away. And same thing was with medals, and with people who wanted them, craved them, and, like, flaunted their achievements openly. Stalin was... In a very strange twist of faith, a humble man later in his life, somewhat. Very powerful, yet he wasn't way that way in glorious as he was during his youth. One of the more interesting accidents, which are tied to medals, happened in the banquet after World War II, and this happened in the banquet for the higher commanding staff of the Red Army, which was just before the famous Victory Day banquet. According to U.E. Muchin's book, <clears throat> Fathers, commanders, stars in the pauldrons, and stars in the graves, the following incident happened. And this is a quote from the book. <clears throat> Marshal Zhukov was sitting at the same table as the chief commander, but he hadn't received any personal words of praise from him. Everyone around the table found this unsettling and a bit weird. The other commanders of the front started to give a quiet signs to Zhukov that, you know, it's time for a smoke break. Zhukov asked Stalin for this small break, and the leader, of course, allowed for this. Stalin smoked his pipe right there, while sitting at the table, but everyone else left for the smoking room. There, the commanders asked Zhukov to give, like, a short speech or something, so that they could continue the banquet with some cheers and toasts for the first marshal of the victory. So Zhukov, upon return, decided to act upon this and started his speech the following way, quote, If you would ask me which time in the war was the hardest for me personally, then I would state that it would be during the autumn and in the winter when we were defending Moscow, when basically the fate of the Soviet Union was being decided. Stalin listened, and listened quietly to this, but then interrupted him. Well, you, comrade Zhukov, uh, recall the defense of Moscow. <laughs> Correct. It was a very difficult time. That was the first victorious battle of our army when we were defending the capital. But do you know that many of her defenders, even generals who were wounded, were left without any awards, and can't even get them anymore as they're invalids now? To this, Zhukov responded, well, comrade Stalin, me, just like you, also haven't been awarded for this battle, even though almost everyone who's working in the General HQ got awarded with Lenin's order. I fully presume that I've made some miscalculations in this affair, and we will fix this, of course. And then Stalin got angry. He smashed his fist in the table so hard that the crystal leg of his tall wine glass broke and the red wine spilled on the tablecloth. The great leader, not allowing Zhukov to speak, yelled at him. <laughs> but at the same time, you didn't forget to give awards to all of your fucking filthy whores! A grave silence overtook the room. And Stalin just got up, left the table, and didn't return. See, Stalin believed uh, that medals and fame belonged to those who deserved it, and for what they actually did, not to those who yearned it and loved to put every award ever on their chest. 
the one he wore, yes, well, he won the war, and the such thought it would be kind of nice to carry that star, and, you know, one star for for, for someone, that's, that's pretty nice. He never went to Brezhnev's level, who just gave him four of these things. But to give something to Zhukov at this point, when that bastard didn't care about the brave men under him, including officers, and hadn't given anything to the people who paid, paid winning the war with their own blood? Nah, Stalin wouldn't do that. Stalin didn't care for medals. But he watched closely the people who liked to put them on. Because, you know, the motherland needs generals everywhere. Including um, on Strafbats, the nice people who were supposed to en- supposed to run first in the enemy positions after tactical nukes were dropped. Which is quite nice. So yeah, I hope that this answers the question, Dave. And with this, we end this episode. And yeah, next time, about the rest of 1907... And how the revolution of 1905 to 1907 ended, and how Stalin ended up in exile once again, and, uh... I would like to say his final transformation, but I'm not sure. Anyhow, thank you for listening, and до свидания, товарищ. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you.